Hi, Dr. Rob. Well, Tammy, good evening to you. You sound like Dr. Fraser Crane. So I'm feeling very, very, yes. Welcome to your therapy session tonight. There so you that's go. That's true. There you go. Okay, here we go. First oh, good. question. How does a person cope with or understand that porn will always be a click away? This sounds like somebody who's the addict and knowing that it's always around and has to choose mm -hmm. differently. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think th that the metaphor for alcoholism is really good here. You know, people who are alcoholic have to negotiate dinners and friends and holidays and, you know, they have to see alcohol all the time. And in terms of that piece, you know, it's not that dissimilar from any addiction. So, you know, what I say to a lot of the porn folks is, um, I know this sounds silly, stay connected because you think you're connected, but you're not really. We, the way that we, one of the best ways we see recovery working is accountability. That, you know, if I really have a computer issue or a social media issue, I call someone in my recovery program at right before I to get online and I say, hey, I'm getting online and I'll be online till noon and I'll check in with you at then. And I don't know about for all of you, but I think for a lot of us addicts, that feeling of they know what I'm doing, not I'm hiding it from them, but they know what I'm doing and I've declared it and now I need to be accountable to it right there and then, that can be really helpful for folks. By the way, Tam, I had someone in the rooms the other night who the exact same thing, they were just saying, oh my God, I." Every time I see a computer, I think about porn. How, are, how am I ever going to control this? And I said, you're not gonna be able to ever control it, but what you can do is be aware of it and understand what it means and then take healthy actions around it. And I think the analogy with alcohol is, is very apt. Um, you know, it's everywhere. I don't drink anymore, I choose not to. So for me, knowing that it's there doesn't mean you know, I, I have a choice. And I think with, you know, yes, the computer is porn, but it's also, you know, lots of other great resources. We have this and there's previously recorded. So, so if I'm at my computer and I'm thinking, oh, porn, 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 I can also think, oh, resources, 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 and choose the other direction. So, so retraining the brain that it isn't all about, I can't do this and I have to stay away from it, but I can choose differently. And as someone in recovery, the more I can choose, the better it is for me. If somebody is just telling me, no, you can't do that, you know, then of course I want to do it more, et cetera. So, so if I decide that this is, I would rather be on this path and I can make choices, you know, that actually is helpful for me. So, okay. And just to build on what Go you ahead. said a moment ago, Tammy, um, we do have a podcast. I'm not trying to sell anything. Podcasts are free. We have half a million people who've downloaded it. They seem to like it. But you know, if you're sitting Thank you. <laughs> Scares me when I hear that, but it's all over the world. It's not just here. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. part of what I hear about the podcast is when people are sitting around the house and they have nothing to do, or they're just chatting with friends online, they may listen or have it going. And there is something I've heard from guys like, oh, I was going to stop there, but your podcast was playing. And I thought, oh, I can't do that. Or a spouse who says, you know, I, I can't stand looking at this person another minute and then they hear stuff on the podcast that's helpful. So I just want to say that's why we did it. Um, and Tammy, if you want to put the link in the chat, that'd be so I will. helpful. Yeah, but, I will. Um, Tammy, back, uh, I know we have other questions. I just wanted to say that because it no, really is helpful. I, I, and I've had, I've had people who have said, anytime I think of relapsing, I listen to a podcast. I've had partners who have said, like when I answer the phone that my voice is familiar. Oh, I've been hearing you on a podcast, you know, so they're engaging with that and finding a, a piece of connection and support, even if it's not in real time, it still is something that is in a positive direction. So I will put the chat in so that, but I'm going to read the next question. I was told that, that I turned to porn because I've, I have a high sex drive, which is probably true since I was young. I do not watch porn often anymore, but when I am tempted, I mainly turn to pictures versus videos. Can a high sex drive be a cause of someone turning to porn? And what does one do if this is the case? Well, that's a lot of questions. And by the way, if I get stuck, Tammy, I know I'm kind of wavering. I can sign back out and back in. Um, so you let me know. I will, but you, so far, so good. If you guys can't hear me or if I freeze. Okay, so um, back to the question. You know, I, I never, I mean, this question doesn't mention addiction. So, you know, I, I think if actually it would be better for me, Tammy, if you read through it real quick and maybe 
try to bring it down to what the question is because it is there's a lot there yes so i was told that i turned to porn because i i have a high sex drive which is pro right. probably true since i am young i do not watch porn often anymore but when i am tempted i mainly turn to pictures versus videos can a high sex drive be a cause of someone turning to porn and what does one do if this is the case so it's can a high sex drive be a cause right well first of all i heard the word young and i have to say being a little older that uh it is easier to manage sex and porn addiction when you're in middle age because you don't i don't have all that testosterone and all the intensity of being young coursing through me um and so you know what i would consider a high sex drive i'm not sure what that means first of all because that may mean something that you there are people who love having a lot of sex and they're not no addiction no problems and i think good for them and then there are people who don't have a lot of sex and they worry there's something wrong with them and i say do you want to have more and they say no and i say good for you so i don't think any sex drive is really better or worse or harder or easier um, but I do think the question, I don't understand what you mean by turned to porn. Does that mean you turned away from relationships? Does that mean you turned away from things that were important to you? I mean, I don't think the porn into its, unto itself is a problem. You said you don't even look that often anymore. I don't know the difference between pictures and videos. I think probably videos are more engaging and might pull you in further for longer. So, hey, you self-corrected. You know, you went from the intensity of moving images to a still image, which is a, does not pull on your sleeve so much. So you sound like somebody who's pretty aware of what you're trying to do. Um, and I don't, uh, I don't think that, I think many, many people look at porn and they look at casually or they look at regularly, whether they're young or they're single or whatever's going on there, or they're grieving something and they want a distraction. It doesn't mean that there's a problem. Problems start when you're isolating, when you find you're spending more time with the computer than you are talking to friends or or doing your school stuff or, or working or you know it's when a good part of my time and attention in, in in every single day is taken up with the pursuit of or involvement with porn i will say however that there are people who have what i call maybe an occasional use problem it's kind of like someone tammy who you know, they really get drunk as poop, you know, when something bad happens, but they don't drink that often. But when they drink, they get drunk. And I think there are also porn addicts who, you know, st stuff happens and you guys will disappear into it for a period of time without it being as consistently problematic as it is for an addict. So I'm not sure if I answered the part I missed, Tammy, please let me let us know no, yeah i think you did I, my one question was i don't hear i have great relationships and you know i'm still doing this or whatever so so that was the only caveat for me was you know if you've got healthy relationships then you know an occasional porn use and like you said self-corrected may not be an issue if you're concerned about it and it's keeping you from being connected with you know people then you know then maybe look at one more level or if you are connected to people and it's taking you away from them, like you're involved with someone. And a lot of spouses of people have porn problems will say to me um, about men in particular, I feel like he's so distracted. I feel like he isn't there. I feel like he's really distant. And we don't understand the person who's doing that, that we're any of those things. We just think we're fine. We just have this little thing that we're hiding. But emotionally, when we're, and biologically, psychobiologically, we're putting so much energy into hours of whatever or the intensity of whatever, it does turn down the interest and involvement in our relationships because they're not as intense. They're not as exciting. And when you're spending, you know, a couple hours a day or many hours a week looking at that and then, expecting your regular life to be woohoo it will not be and it starts to diminish so when it becomes more important than your regular life and you say well that's okay i'll just keep doing it it's a problem so the next question in a joint therapy session with the addicts therapist with no topics discussed as a boundary would there ever be a reason for the addicts therapist to openly and consistently lie to the betrayed spouse my essay husband saw his csat for 20-ish sessions and initially took multiple sex trauma and childhood assessments so the therapist was very aware of his issues i've also seen these assessments in our first joint session my husband csat said that the marriage problems were due to my sexual issues i do not have any and because my husband could not trust me to tell me the truth 
about his secret life. He also said the only way that his addictions played a role in our marriage demise was when we had a disagreement. He would use sex to numb. But the main issue were the disagreements themselves, not the numbing activities. Would a therapist lie to protect the addict or could he possibly believe the addict's lies? Help. Okay, since you read that, it's a lot. Um, I do want to say just in general, but I'm not, I want to go back to the question because there's a lot there. So hang in there, Tammy, and ask you to tell me more. <laughs> yeah. But a um, couple of things. I don't know whose therapist this is, whether this is the couple's therapist or one of your individual therapists. Maybe did someone it said, said my husband's- in a joint therapy session with the addict's therapist. So this sounds like right. his therapist and we did a joint right. session. Okay. Well, when I'm working with partners, especially ones I don't know well, what I'm thinking about is, wow, I bet I'm going to get a lot of information I don't know about. I bet I'm going to hear a version of this, their life together or whatever's going on that I have not heard from my client. Because I don't know if you're aware of this, but addicts lie to us, even to us therapists often. And I've had many of the client who says, well, I got to tell you something, you know, I've been lying for three months and I understand exactly how your spouses feel because I've been pouring my time and energy into this person. But I also, you know, they're not, I'm not related to them that my loved ones so I can more compassionately uh, redirect their lying into what the heck's going on with them. Um, but hold on, I'm gonna go. so Tammy, I wanted to say there's more in that question I was going to ask you about because it's a lot of stuff and I'm not sure about the question. Oh, one more thing, sorry. I would never, ever, 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 ever in my entire life ever in 35 years of doing this work, tell a spouse that there was anything about her or him that was causing the addiction. It doesn't matter whether you have sexual problems or not. I wanna say something rude now. You could give someone no access whatsoever to touching or kissing you or loving you in any way. You can lock the door every night your husband can leave. He can get a divorce. He can buy a car. He can go, you can adopt some kids. There are a lot of things that people can do to give their life meaning and hope and excitement when their marriage isn't doing so well. And so I always want to tell you, say to you spouses, what did you do wrong that led to this person seeing sex workers being online with porn? You know, what did you do or not do exactly? And some of you will say, well, I, I've, I've really gained all that weight. I never got rid of it. And, you know, I've been so focused on the kids. I haven't really been present. You know, some of you will say, well, you know, I'm not as young as I used to be. And I've been, you know, whatever it is. And the minute you say anything that even hints to me that you think it's your fault, I'm going to stop you and say, there's nothing that you as a spouse can ever, ever, ever do to make me go act out my addiction, whether it's gambling or drinking or whatever. I can be very unhappy and we can be very unhappy, but I can do a lot of things with that unhappiness other than go pursue sexual relationships. Uh, I, so just I just wanted to include that because there's a little hint in your communication of, well, the therapist told me I wasn't this and the ter therapist, and I don't know how much you might take that in, but I'm telling you, there you may make him miserable, but you have nothing to do with his problems. Those are, those he causes himself. So the ultimate question is: Would a therapist lie to protect the addict, or could he possibly believe the addict's lies? Okay, thank you for that, Tammy. So, uh, as I said, we lie to therapists all the time, and we especially lie to therapists about our spouses. Because we want that there. I'm talking about in the early recovery, first seeing these therapists, we, we do what we do with everyone, sex and love addicts. We seduce. We don't want them to, and we do it with you. We don't want them to think we're as bad as we think we are. So we only tell them this, or we, not all of us. I mean, some of us, you know, go right out there and say it. So I will always tend to, to believe, quite honestly, the therapist over the client, <laughs> at least in the beginning. But, you know, if I were, had an issue with what a therapist said, you know, if Tammy were running that group and I felt uncomfortable with the way that, that had gone, I would call them up and I would say, I'm sorry, did you mean this? Or is this what you meant? Because I just really want to understand that better. Not anything about your spouse, nothing, but this is something that this person said to you. So I would think it's perfectly fine to clarify that uh, because I would never want to hear any therapist um, lying to you about anything. Um, that's not our job to protect another person. But let me just say one more thing about that. Some of you guys are in couples therapy and that's the only person you're seeing. And if you're in early recovery or in the first year of this process, it's not really a good idea. And let me tell you why. Um, couples therapists often like to see the couple and they like to see each person and kind of get a, a feeling about the whole thing. 
well, if I'm a couples therapist and I'm seeing the two of you and Tammy's my patient, she comes to see me and she says, as the wife and says, well, let me tell you all the sexual stuff I've been doing. And, and then she says, but don't tell my husband when we have a couple session. Well, what situation does that put me in as a therapist? That's a, ther that's a situation I never want to be in. So every therapist should say up front, if they're working with a couple, I don't keep secrets and I don't lie. So if you tell me something, this is a couples therapist, if you tell me something, you can expect that I'm going to ask you to tell your spouse when we meet again, because I don't hold secrets. And of course, that would be horrible for you, right? Because if you were seeing, if you were seeing a therapist who was supposed to be there, there for both of you, and you found out that he or she knew things that you didn't and kept it from you, that would be awful. And you'd lose all your trust in the therapist. So we never want to be in a role where we are a couple of things. I never want to be in a role where I'm saying what my client did or didn't do. If you ask me, did with my spouse, with that person in the room, did you do this or not? If I'm the therapist, did he do this or not? Did she do this or not? I'm going to say, well, let's ask them. And then you and I sit there and find out what the truth is. But I'll never say, let me tell you about what your spouse has done or your, and I will never disclose it. Um, I'm sorry, I, I will not, but I will talk to you individually if you have questions about you. And then I'll call your husband and say, I want, you know, I talked to her and this is what she called me about. So um, I don't think there's any occasion on which a therapist would lie to someone unless they were so mentally ill that we needed to protect them or ourselves. Uh, we do our best to keep ourselves. I mean, we're role models for you guys. So if we're lying, that's not a good thing. I'm starting to go on and on, Tammy. No, it, it, next question. Is it common for sex addicts to display characteristics of Peter Pan syndrome that is emotionally immature and requiring a lot of attention for a start? Tammy, do you want to try that one? <laughs> Uh, to me, I would be like, yes, narcissistic, self-absorbed, you know, want all the, want everything to go my way. Me, 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 me. So yes. And I think what we do in our treatment program is help them understand that it isn't really, the world does not necessarily revolve around them. Actually, it doesn't revolve around them. So anyway, but Peter Pan syndrome is a specific comment. So thoughts? Um well, since you mentioned the treatment center, I just want to say that there are, there's a full house of gentlemen who are sitting in a room as they do every week in treatment uh, on Mondays and Fridays and listening to this. So um, sometimes they have questions. And by the way, all you spouses who know that someone is in treatment with us, if you're on, they're on. If they're with us, they're on. Because this whole way of communicating from before treatment to the middle of treatment to after treatment to have a constant relationship with you guys, free or not, is, is what it's all about for us. Um, I wrote this word down and now I forgot. Tammy, the word was? Peter Pan syndrome? Yes. Um, so I know what it was. I just can't read my own writing. Um, there's a phrase also used in the other 12 step, step programs that I think really depicts who an addict in early recovery is. And I mean, the first six months to a year. And the phrase is king baby. You know, that's the person who thinks they're in charge of everything and everyone needs to do what they need. Of course, they're only really this little teeny, you know, they really don't have any power at all, but they're sitting on there kind of telling everyone to, what to do. And, you know, that's from being used to how do I say this? Addicts are used to running the world on their terms, because if you know you don't know things and someone else doesn't know things and I know everything, then I'm the one who can run the world because I decide what's true or not when I talk to anybody. But people in recovery, we got to tell everyone everything. And that's when the when the challenges start. But Tammy, um, do you want to respond to that as well? Well, the emotional uh, immaturity. Anything else? King well, baby? I, the, 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 well, but the emotional immaturity is that, you know, it, it and if we are constantly using our addictive behavior to numb out, to escape our emotions, we are, you know, by definition, emotionally immature. In recovery, we learn to have emotional maturity. It's a process, but it takes ongoing work and it doesn't just happen overnight. We don't fix everything in our treatment center in the short time that we have them, but we give them a path forward. But, but for some, it requires ongoing work. You know, it is not something that's one and done now I'm all good, so. And to, and to speak to that, I when a lot of you spouses, female in particular, get on this, um, this Q&A or one of the others that I do, I often hear, Tommy does too, I don't understand, here she's been working on this for 
for six months and they've stopped acting out. And I really think they're, they're really trying and they're going to the groups and everything, but they're such a jerk. How come they haven't learned to be a decent human being while, you know, and the answer is, I think that, that we've kept a lot of parts of ourselves hidden. We are really struggling in the beginning to be figure out what life is all about. And we may, may not have been the most kind people to begin with. So tackling the early recovery tasks of not acting out, uh, not following that path into destruction, not ruining my life further, and figuring out how and why I did this and how to stop, that's a lot for the beginning. And unfortunately for you partners who feel understandably like, hey, I deserve to have somebody who's emotionally available and present after all you did to me, you're right. But we can't always quite do that in the beginning. It's not an excuse. It's just um, empathy takes time to learn. Compassion takes time to learn and showing it takes even longer. And it um, takes role models. It's not one of those things where going and seeing a therapist, even the best therapist, even the Dr. Rob, if you saw him, which he doesn't do this, but if you saw him for 50 minutes once a week, it's going to take a really, really long time. It's, you know, it's all of the oh. other resources that help mold and shape and, and give more information and create safe spaces. So, and help guide away from, oh, I want to act out. I want to act out. I want to act out. It's like, okay, I can choose differently. So, and, and I'm going to add to that. Um, maybe because I know who we're talking to here. And so, you know, I really want to be useful to you guys. Um, recovery is not a ticket to stopping the behavior. I mean, that's, that's just the start. That's just the minimum requirement is to stop the behavior. Those of us who are committed to, those of us who have this problem realize that the behavior was the tip of the iceberg. And there are all kinds of things about how we engage people, present ourselves, keep secrets, manipulate. There are all kinds of uh, our ways of living that we have to give up. And so I really think that this process is a way of life. You know, and it's not like a, you're joining a cult when you go to a 12 step program or not like I'm some kind of, you know, I'm going to make you drink the Kool-Aid. I'm just saying that the goal here is for you to become a different kind of person, someone who's more compassionate, more engaged, more curious, more grateful. And yes, there are very immature people that we're working with, because as Tammy said, they had a place to go with their uncomfortable feelings and they're overwhelmed. Now they just got to put up with it. And by the way, they're no longer in control because a lot of you already know what they've been doing. And so they can no longer parse reality and the truth. So in the beginning, we can be difficult people. And I'm, you know, I'm sorry, because I know your spouses feel like you deserve better. Um, and I'm not making excuses. It's just, we don't know any better on some level. But we can learn if we are we can committed learn. To, the, to the process. So next question, can a porn addict ever return to using a computer normal again? without filters after recovery? Well, I guess my question is why would you wanna try? I mean, if the filters work for you and they're helping to keep you sober or stop the behavior, or they give you a long enough period of time that your brain just really gets away from that constant wave of intensity, you know, it might be helpful to take them off, but that's like saying, um, I don't know. It's it's like a an, an alcoholic who's in early recovery and their spouse says, you know, I'd like to start drinking at home again. And there's that real question of can I handle, am I ready to um, see the, the wine in the refrigerator or not? You know, we may not know until it happens. But there are, by the way, just for those of you who don't know it, there are different kinds of, um, of software that do different kinds of things um, in terms of keeping us safe. For example, there's software that tracks us, which means every little keystroke, everything we do is recorded and then it's sent on that information to a therapist or to a sponsor or not to spouses, by the way. It's not healthy for you spouses to see every single keystroke because you'll look and you'll watch. But there's other forms of, um, of uh, protective software that involve things like they will um, uh, they will filter out certain words or they'll filter out certain kinds of, so you put in sex, you put in this and that not available to you. So they're kind of like kids monitoring, if you will, but it's adapted to adults. And I really like the kind that tracks someone because when I'm they're making that keystroke, I don't actually want the computer to stop them. I want their thought of, wow, if I do this, someone else is going to hold me accountable later. I'm gonna have to have a conversation about it. And I'm not saying a spouse, I'm saying someone else I really respect I'm trying to get help from. I think that builds a lot more long-term character and also helps the brain, I think, go in the right direction with this, which is I need to reach out to somebody, not I need to be alone with it. So Tammy, lots of questions. Um, 
Anything else? Next, nope, that was good. Next You're one. You're rolling I am, them out tonight. You're well, rolling them out. Well, there's a lot. So okay. I, I'm a quicker. sex addict. When choosing a therapist in a, uh, is a sex therapist as adequate as a sex addiction therapist? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, so let's just run through a couple of things. Sex therapists are not always trained in mental health. Um, it's sort of like a nurse practitioner is what I think of. They are good at bandaging and, you know, and they're good at with very specific sexual issues like fetishes and kink and how do I improve our sex life? But when you have something like an addiction, it really requires a much higher level of focus. So um, I got a PhD in sexology, um, but there were people taking certifications in some of those courses who didn't even have a master's and they were going to go out well in that particular state and, and hang a shingle that says I'm a sex therapist. I don't think many sex therapists have a clue about a, the addictive process. And I would say that most sex therapists are the, well, it depends on when they went to school, but might be less likely because you have to understand as a sex therapist, if I were just in that role, my role is to encourage sexuality and calm people down around their sexuality and help them feel more comfortable and not shame themselves. And, and that's not what you want to do with an addict. Addicts you want to confront and challenge and, you know, do almost the opposite. So I think it's not enough to be a sex therapist. I think, and, and one more thing, CSATs, yes, certified sex addiction people, they're not always great either, but it depends on who it is, but they certainly understand the process and what's needed and the desired outcome. Um, they're not in the same place as a sex therapist. So to sum up, sex therapists are generally there to improve your sex life or help you come to terms with some part of it that seems uncomfortable or shameful to you or something that doesn't work and you wanna fix it, uh, body parts and stuff like that. But addiction therapists are more, most often masters, if not PhD level. And we, all, we already grasp and are licensed in and experienced in mental health. And then we may specialize in addiction and then in sexuality. So, you know, um, yeah, I think that's, they're really different categories. Um, a lot of folks in my classes for sexuality didn't know a clue about addiction. Um, but a lot of my folks in addiction classes went back, way back in the day understood that there were behavioral addictions like eating and sex. Um, Tammy, thoughts? I mean, you work with so many oh, folks, I, or do you uh, want to uh, keep rolling? No, well, I really agree with that. And I, I say this all the time, you know, it, you go to your general practitioner doctor for general stuff. You go to the specialist that's highly trained in what you have a like cancer and and when I had my sinus surgery, I want the right person. And so I'm glad you're asking. And and if you're a sex addict, the probably the best fit is somebody who's certified to work specifically with sex addiction. And I the generalist addiction person that works with alcohol, they don't necessarily have the training with it either. So I often hear about problematic. You know, consequences from an addiction specialist who is just working with alcohol and drugs. So you're doing this, what does that mean? Look for experts, look for experts. You know, I was online, um, oh, Tammy, it's such a great opportunity. I was on in the rooms on last Friday night and someone said, I've been looking for a treatment center and I really go to want to go to one for sex addiction or compulsive porn use or, or where do I go? And I said, well, thank you for asking the question because I run a treatment program in California and I went through it. But more importantly, I went through like what good treatment is. And part of, I mean, residential or inpatient, part of the problem is, and I'm very aware of this, when you go online, all the treatment centers do everything. Oh, we treat sex or we treat drugs or we treat this and that. And I think having been inside of those institutions and uh, been involved in creating some of those institutions that while they have the client's heart best, well, they have our best interests in mind, they don't understand the issues. If you have sexual compulsivity or porn issues, you're not going to sit with a bunch of alcoholics and talk about your problem. You need specific treatment because you know if i'm sitting with a bunch of alcoholics so seeking specialty treatment means those are the only people who are there i'm not dealing with alcoholics or drug addicts i'm just focused on what i'm and i think the second piece is and i just have to say this again and again is experts you know we live in a time where every website looks like everyone looks like they're doing every uh, social media environments whoever says oftentimes you know it's not your degree or where you went to school or what you know it's it's how provocative can you be and how sexy can your website be and so when i'm looking for a therapist when i'm looking for a treatment program i want people who've written books 
or people who at least active with a blog or I can see their work. I want people that, um, that I can see that they have been involved with treatment programs before or have addiction experience. I don't think it's enough, especially now folks, and you know this, for people to say anything online. What matters to me is what is their actual experience working with people? And is that going to benefit the people that I wanna to encourage to see them? Um, I'm a tag on to that. I, I share when people call asking about help, I share that you know you and Dr. David both teach other therapists around the world how to work with clients with this and you're both working directly with clients at our treatment program. And, and I often share, you know, we don't do everything. This is all we do, but we do it expertly. And I think that that really matters in this particular arena. You know, we aren't, you know, if you're struggling with something else, you know, that's not us, but well, that's, for this, yeah, I mean, if we you do it really, really well. We have a lot of women who call and ask for sex addiction treatment or, or and some of you may not realize this is a huge shameful problem for many, many women. Um, but we specialize in men. And I know other programs that specialize in women. Um, and I think, again, the more specific the work can get, the more less the person is a generalist in that sense. And uh, the more educated they are, expert they are, you're in a better, uh, you're in a better place. By the way, Tammy sitting over, are you on my right or my left where you are? I'm you're to my right. You. Uh, right right now I'm up in oh I've oh, got more a like staff, Brady Bunch so yeah yeah oh okay um so uh I was anyway. just gonna say that Tammy makes a lot of referrals and if you write it right to sorry to make your e your e-box fill up but if you write tami at seekingintegrity.com um, we don't get paid for making referrals. We don't get kickbacks. We don't run a women's program. So there are a lot of, we don't run a couples program. So there are a lot of places that we can refer people um, and a lot of different things that are available to you that you may not know about. And, you know, we don't charge to try to help folks out in that way. So drop us a note. Next question. My husband CSAT told me that sex addiction is not always about intimacy issues and that some sex addicts do sexual, emotional intimacy. I thought one of the main definitions of sex addiction was not wanting connection or not wanting sexual intimacy. Is his therapist correct? Um, so again, I often question what people say their therapist said. Am I, are we in Yeah, that but situation? this one said, this is someone says that my husband's therapist told me. So there, it, it sounds like it came okay. directly from the therapist. So, okay. Because otherwise I would be concerned about that too. But this is the husband's okay. therapist so, said to this person. Let me be more clear about what the question is. Um, I think any addiction is defined by how is that behavior or that substance, right? Alcohol, whatever. How is that affecting that person's ability to function? in multiple areas. Is there porn sexual behavior? Does it affect the intimacy in their marriage? Does it affect their being focused at work? Does it affect their being uh, having emotional availability for their kids? Excuse me, there are lots of areas in which um, uh, sex addiction can significantly or any addiction can si significantly diminish someone's life. So one of the outcomes of the addiction is that we end up not in being in non-intimate relationships. And those are not consciously chosen. What we do is we actually get as close to you as we can, you partners, you wives and husbands and all that. And then we try to make sure that we've got you nailed down and we won't lose you and you're happy so we can run over here and distract ourselves and disappear. So it's not that I would say that I didn't want intimacy. I've said all my life that I want intimate loving relationships. It's more that we are scared of them and we tend to invite them in and then run it. We do this, we invite them in and then we run away at the same time. And, um, and so I don't think it's about, I don't want intimacy or I don't want sexual intimacy. I think another way of saying it is that intimacy is frightening to us and sexual intimacy sometimes even more uh, because of our history is and our abuse. So um, us being relaxed and comfortable and open and relational connected to you during sex and on the way to it we'd rather have sex with a stranger because we don't have any control with you and what, maybe we won't get aroused and maybe it won't get go well and maybe it won't be as exciting as it is out there. So, you know, I'd rather read and have sex over there as, a, as an active sex addict. So yes, I don't think, yes, that's a double negative. I think this is about an intimacy avoidance, but it's not based on a desire to, uh, on a desire to avoid intimacy. 
um, it's not conscious, but we end up avoiding intimacy. And yes, I call sex addiction, love addiction, porn addiction, intimacy disorders. I don't just call them that because it's easier to say and makes you feel more comfortable. The challenge of intimacy, relatedness, connection, loving, that is at the root underneath the iceberg of the addiction is the ability or inability to deeply connect because without deeply connecting, we're never gonna be, we're never happy people. Yeah, I agree. The only other thing I was thinking to add on to that was, um, and I'm negatively impacting our intimacy if I'm betraying you. So like that is an intimacy oh, issue from, from that standpoint too, whether it's anonymous sex or it's an affair partner or whatever it is, I'm still betraying this primary relationship. So, okay, next question. Can a sex addict recover and not return to acting out? My husband is working recovery and also says he desires nothing but me since revealing his childhood trauma and his addiction is out in the open. Also, can they fall in love with a sex worker? Well, and then there's an well, add-in. Is it possible him desiring nothing but me? Okay, well, that's a lot of questions, but uh, yes. what I'd be really curious about in this question, Tammy, is how long? Uh -huh has this person been working on it? How long um, How long has he been saying he desires nothing else but you? Has he been doing this for three months or six months or a year? Because someone in the beginning, I think, who three, four months in says they desire nothing but you is full of crap. And they're trying to distract you and make you feel great and have a lot of sex with you so you won't challenge them or be upset with them anymore. Um, so if it's been a year, um, or a year and a half that he's sincerely been working recovery, I would think he'd be in the stage of really, of you getting to know each other intimately, sexually, and beginning to regrow what you had. So um, I, I, so here's, I'll say one more thing. Sex addicts are so used to chasing intensity and, so, and thinking that sex. So sex workers disappearing into the sex, hours and hours in porn, the excitement, losing ourselves and all of that, that's really our goal. And you know, when we look at a spouse who we've been with for 10 or 20 years, you look great, but you don't look nearly as exciting as all those images online or all those. So my sexuality with my spouse, the one I love, cannot come from as an addict, that same place I go to when I'm visiting a sex worker or seeing, uh, seeing an affair partner or playing with cam boys or girls online. That, my sexuality around that is a lot of an intensity and superficiality and control. But for a lot of sex addicts, that's all we're used to. So if we approach you as a partner and we don't have that intensity and that distraction and we don't know what to do because that's actually what we're afraid of is simply being present with you, it brings up a lot of stuff for our past, from our past. Can someone, what was the question about sex worker? Can they fall in love with a sex worker? Well, I think anybody can fall in love with anybody and people are defined by more than sex workers. So, you know, I, I can't really say, but I will say that, I mean, I can't speak to that particular issue, but I will say this, a lot of sex addicts, because we're so longing for attention and validation, all that narcissistic stuff, um, from any place we can find it. This is going to sound strange, but it's not unusual when we are on a call service where you talk to someone about sex and they charge you every five minutes, or we're seeing a sex worker on a regular basis or a stripper. We start to want to believe that we're the special one, that we're the one that they you know, the rest of the people, they pay them and we pay them too, but we're the ones they really care about. By the way, sex workers know this and, and every single person who comes to them is the most special person that they see because they know this. But um, so I think a lot of addicts fall in love with chasing the unavailable person and this idea of I'm, will I be special enough for them to want to be with despite all that experience and blah, blah, blah. So I don't know that it's falling in love so much it is finding an, another way to be intensely distracted from, from their lives. Yes, actually I hear that kind of stuff all the time. And I always say that's a good business person that that person is you know, making sure that you are extra special and, you know, I, I, she, she or he needs all these gifts and support. So I call it good customer service. There you go. Okay. Next question. After my second affair, my ex-wife decided to move forward with divorce. I've been on my own now for several months. She is willing to work things out and try again. However, I'm finding I've been happier on my own with the option to start a real relationship with the person whom I cheated on her with. 
yet I still feel stuck. Should I continue working on myself and be alone? And maybe the answer on who to be in a relationship will come. Please help. Well, I love this question. And Tammy, you know, I love this question because it, when, especially when I was in private practice, I had to have a man come into my office and say, you know, doc, I have a problem. I don't know which one. And I always knew what he was talking about. It's his wife and his affair partner or her husband and her affair partner. And, you know, they would come in and they would say, here's the problem. I don't know which one, you know, I mean, I've been with this person 20 years and we have a lot of special stuff and, but it's been really bad for a while. And then there's this person that's so exciting and we're so connected and it's so, and, you know, I, two things, I, I'm not in a job to tell you which one ever, but I, I do say this to men in particular, how are you going to feel if you go from one relationship to the other? And you don't feel clean about it. Like you don't feel, if you don't feel, if you're married and you don't feel you're given every chance you have to make that right, how will you ever know if you left something for the right reasons or the wrong reasons? And so if you're seeing someone else, your spouse will always come in second. They don't have that body. Besides which, by the way, with your affair partner, you don't have to worry about the laundry or the dusting the furniture. You know, you're not full partner. You're just there for the fun. So being with an affair partner in real life is not probably going to be that different over time than being with your spouse, unless you guys don't get along. Um, so you're to the answer to your question. Um, I do agree with you. I think that uh, um, if you're not really sure what is best for you and what you want, don't ruin one or both lives by saying, well, I'm going to commit or try this and then find out you want something else. The other thing is I, you know, I, I often, so I wrote this book called Out of the Doghouse, a relationship saving guide for men caught cheating. And I wrote Out of the Doghouse because so many men that I work with, they, they're not sure if they want to stay committed to their relationships or not, the ones that they've broken. And then if they decide to stay with them, they have no idea how to really heal the brokenness that they've caused. And I wanted to give them a book to try to think about this. Um, but one of the things it says in Out of the Doghouse is be really sure that you want to be with this person because it's going to take a lot of work to heal a troubled relationship. So if you look at what your marriage might be, if you go back into it, it's going to be no easy ride, you know, and, and by the way, if you go to the affair, it's partner is going to be a really easy ride. So my question to you is, you know, um, do you know, will you be able to leave your marriage and feel good? Like you did everything you could to make it right. And the reason I brought up out of the doghouse is I don't, I think I've told you this, Tammy, when it first came out, I, I was out doing some interviews about it. And there were some radio people I was talking to. And these two particular men, different stations, different places, had both read the book, which I think is very unusual for a media person. But I think they read it because they had something for themselves to read in it. And what both men told me before I did my interviews, he said, they said, you know, I read out of the doghouse, which is a book about really going in and re-examining it for the cheater and making it right in the right way. Both of these men said to me, you know, I'm 55 or 60 and I'm on my second marriage and I have a new family. And, but I think if I had read this and they get tearful, I might've been able to save my first marriage. And they say it like they didn't know it at the time, but that relationship was deeply important to them and deeply special. And, and they didn't know how to fix it. They didn't know how to make it better and they weren't sure. So I think it is best for you to take time with yourself and for yourself doing a lot of work on yourself. Um, and I also think you need to pick one or the other for the, even for like, you can pick neither. I'm just going to work on myself or you can say, I'm going to work on my marriage or I'm going, to, but you, what you can't do is, you know, on Thursday, you see your fair partner and Friday, you see your, your a wife. You'll, it's the same as what you've been doing. You have to make a decision about what relationship you want to work on. And if it isn't your marriage, then the door's already closed. By the way, do me a favor, please don't torture your, your maybe ex-wife by going in and out. And don't tell her about your indecision and you know, just take it a little bit at a time because this woman is moving back toward you and you've devastated her already. So I would be very careful in how, because you may not get another chance to re-engage her. So if you're gonna tell her, might be the other person, just know you may, you're probably not gonna get any more chances over there. So I don't think I gave a straight answer, but I didn't really want no, to. No, I think that was really good. And, and I was thinking um, while you were sharing too, how many times I get calls from the betrayed partner 
who used to be the affair partner. But, but think about it. It's like these people cheated and like they think they're going to get together and it's all going to be great now. But like you said, then there's the laundry and bills to pay and real life garbage to take out and things like that. And so then it isn't all the, you know, the clandestine and all of this fun stuff. And so then the next thing happens is they cheat again. So, so my other mm-hmm. encouragement is, you know, if this has been a pattern for you of, cause it says right. after my second affair, so, so like there was another one. And so part, part of, yeah, that was how it started after oh. my second affair. So part of me is going, I'm wondering if there's more of a pattern here. And now you just are kind of hung up on this particular one, but we'll be there a third affair. If you hang out with, if you choose the affair partner. So that's my thought. Well, I would even ask, I'm sorry, Tammy, I mean, around. no, that's good. I would even ask if you were in treatment with us at Seeking Integrity, I would say to you, so who are you lining up as the next person who's going to take the place of your affair partner? Who, or even if you haven't lined them up yet, just it's a great treatment question. Who would be the next person on your list once this you've got this next marriage going that you would start looking at and saying, hmm, because you know your pattern, there will be somebody, pardon me. And as, as Tammy said, have you ever found a way out of that pattern? Or have you just moved from one meaningful relationship to another? Because... I understand serial monogamy for some people works, but you're not asking the kind of questions with someone who's happy with serial monogamy. You're asking the kind of questions as someone who doesn't know how to find the relationship they can stay in or how to stay in the right one. Um, And by the way, the affair will always be a great distraction. Oh my God, you're never in your relationship because the phone might ring, you might get a text. There's always that, you know, thing going on. And boy, is that very different than living with that person and hearing that they fart and have zits and, you know, they're not always dressed up and ready to go out with you. So anyway, I I don't think you can do both and I'm not sure you can do either yet. So the best is to be on your own. Okay, next question. I recently began recovery for love addiction and I've realized that the only people I've ever been truly attracted to have been unavailable because of addiction, narcissism or marriage. I am not interested in people I can actually be with in a relationship. I have always been quickly bored by people who are always available by the constant longing and fantasizing is driving me insane. I feel like I want a normal quote unquote relationship with an abnormal person. Maybe it's because I've only been in recovery a month that's a clue. Um, um, But I do not understand this. Is there hope for me to have a healthy relationship with someone I'm actually compatible with? I also want to have much more sex than my partners on the rare occasions I am in a relationship. So that's a lot. Well, as someone who who spent a lot of time around alcoholics, I think, and I think this is a woman. Yeah. I don't know that for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised, but but let's just listen to the voice. So what do you, what do you think, Tammy, just kicking that one off? Well, first of all, you've been in recovery a month. Yay. But that's a really short time and hang in there. It does change and it gets better. I love that you're looking at this. And, you know, if you're hanging out in recovery places with like even online, you know, with people, you're going to hear, don't make any decisions now. You've got time to take a look at this and see what your patterns are. But, you know, no relationships for a while are a, a good choice until you have more clarity, have more, you know, have, have more recovery, uh, you know, underneath you to, to grow with, have a posse. Dr. Rob has talked often about having a dating posse and all of that. But in addiction, we're always looking for the adrenaline. And so of course, all of those people are gonna be way more fun. They're gonna be the catch, they're gonna be the chase. And somebody who is available and wants to be with you is gonna be boring, but you also probably, in my active addiction, I wasn't I wasn't um, a high number. Like Dr. Rob says, you know, a two isn't gonna attract an eight, you know? Well, I was lower on that scale than I am in recovery. And so I suspect that the people that you attract are also in a lower number scale, so to speak. So, so give yourself space, give yourself time, do what you need to do for the recovery stuff. And the rest of it, honestly, I pr- promise if you're doing what you need to do, you know, those pieces will unfold for you as you're asking the right questions, which you are, and you have people to support you. Yeah, I mean, Tammy, I, I'd love to put make that into a plaque. That was perfect, you know. <laughs> I think all I could say is that, you know, um, like every addict, you're really in a hurry. 
And I understand that, you know, you finally found the keys to the kingdom and what's been screwing up your life for a while. Um, you're, but you're already on to looking at other things. And I would say, you know, start, st start with the alcohol. That's where you are, be where you are. Um, of, you know, other things are gonna come up. Money is gonna come up, jobs are gonna come up. Nothing comes up as powerfully as relationships, but there are gonna be a lot of questions you're gonna have about how do I live now as opposed to how I lived before. And, you know, I will say this, um, I do a Friday night group just like this on In the Rooms, and I have a lot of women who are drug addicts and alcoholics in early recovery. Well, this, and they will this say, is recovery for love addiction. So there's no mention of alcohol. It's just love addiction. So Oh, I'm sorry. I yeah. thought this person so, said that they were newly. No, I'm in second. recovery for love addiction. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't. Okay. Well, I'll drop that part and say this. Yes. Um. But you're right, well, you're, even in the rooms, there's lots of people with love addiction too. But I, I, what I wanted to address, thank you, was the constant fantasizing and longing. You know, that's human. You're single. And maybe when you were using, um, all, that fa all that longing and emptiness got covered up with using and drinking and sex and, you know, whatever you did. But that longing that you're talking about, that is a lot of what we run away from. <laughs> when we're drinking and using, it is the part of you that wants to be touched by people's hearts, deeply connected. That longing is what we all really want in connection with other people that, that we deny ourselves in addiction. So I'm glad that you're filled with longing and emptiness. That sh is exactly where you should be. And I hope you can be patient enough to fill that loneliness and emptiness with other people. If you're a woman, other women, if you're a man, other men who you're not sexually attracted to in recovery so that you can really, really focus on what you need to focus on. I do have a small story about this. Some of the women that I work with will say, love addicts will say, you know, I went into my AA room and this really lovely woman was holding out her arms and saying, welcome to AA. And so she was a greeter, you know, that's kind of a job, welcome. But I kind of shoved her aside because there was this really cute guy behind her that I wanted to talk to more. And the answer, and the more, of course, it was much more important for her to engage that lovely, wise woman who might have supported her than it would ever be useful for her to check out yet a new guy. But that's where we go. And especially when we're just starting to look at this stuff. So, and yes, it can get different and it can get better. So on Tuesday nights on this platform, we have a women's and we're, like I said, we're making the assumption you're a woman. We have groups for men too, but there is a women's sex and love addiction group on this platform on Tuesday nights. And there's another one on Thursday nights, but there are multiple groups for men as well. So, so I'm glad you're here. This is like fantastic, but listen to the podcasts. I put the link in the chat. Keep joining these. Um, you know, it's one of those we talk about in 12 Up. Keep coming back. It does get different. So next question. My addict CSAT said, here's one of those where it starts off. My addict CSAT said, did he say it to you? Um, said that addiction is never a problem and can't be a symptom of a divorce. The problem is inability to cope with emotion. But even if he weren't, uh, we're not an addict, we would still be in our same situation, aka divorcing due to 10 years of infidelity. What are your thoughts on this? So Tammy, can you phrase that one? Because I think again, so, not yeah, a symptom it, of, yeah, uh, help, please. Addiction is never a problem and can't be a symptom of divorce. The problem well, is inability to cope with emotion. Well, that's what addiction is, is the inability say, to cope with by emotions. Definition. Yeah, exactly. It's the same thing. If I knew how to manage and cope with my emotions, needs, and feelings, I, I would, in a healthy way, I wouldn't need to drink, use, or have sex with strangers. So mm -hmm. um, I don't, it, so this gets, first of all, it, did you say the the client said this about what it's went a, on in therapy? My addict CSAT said, but we don't know if the addict CSAT said it to the partner or if the addict CSAT said it to the addict and the addict said my CSAT said. So so if oh. you didn't hear it from this therapist oh, this person yourself, wrote a, wrote we a, don't know. The therapist said it me directly. Oh. 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 So, uh, oh. so um, I don't understand. Um, that makes no sense to me. Um, Addiction can be and is a leading sort uh, right next to domestic violence, one of the leading reasons and financial issues why people don't stay together, um, whether it's alcoholism or drug addiction or gambling or gaming or, you know, work or whatever it is. So the, and it takes all the juice out of the relationship, all the gas, you know, it leaves a lifeless, empty thing. So uh, now 
unrevealed addiction is a, a reason why a lot of people don't stay together. That addict piles right through and you never knew that they weren't present. Addiction unrecovered certainly can lead to a lot of broken relationships and a lot of situations like that. Um, but um, if he were an addict, if he were not an addict, would we still be in the same situation? So let me say one more thing about that. Um, I think about 80%, maybe 85% of the couples that I work with and those who are involved with seeking integrity stay together. Most of those couples have been together a while. So it tends to be the couple that's been together eight or 10 years or 20 or 30. They have family, relationships, kids, church, you know, everything. And, and this, while a huge issue, is not something they really want to tear their entire lives apart over. And so they work on it and they don't necessarily tear it apart. But I'll tell you what, there are lots of people for whom the addiction was the breaking point of many, many years of other problems. In other words, I don't always see, in fact, I often don't see as painful as, as hard as it is, and Tammy can correct me on this, addiction ending relationships unless the addiction is not resolved, in which case, yeah, it can ruin, ruin them forever. Um, but I don't really see it the other way around. So Tammy, do you, oh, I know what I'm gonna say. If you weren't, sorry, I'm gonna say a million things. What we can do in therapy in terms of relationships, we can help you communicate better. We can help you be better listeners. We can help you treat each other differently. We can help you um, get more involved in each other's lives or say things in a better way for the other person to understand. But I'll tell you what, we cannot change who you are. And there are, and, and I had a wonderful therapist say to me once about a relationship. He said, you know, whoever you are with that person, that's who you're gonna be. And whoever they are with you, that's who they're gonna be. And addiction may have nothing to do with the nature of who the two of you are together and what's happened, but it may be the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of, in other words, I don't see addiction breaking up most relationships, but I do see addiction breaking up a lot of deeply unhappy relationships. Okay, next question and probably our final, we'll see. Do you have- That's okay. Do you have to have disclosure and a polygraph to get through betrayal? Is it possible to heal without it? So let me just say for the folks who don't know what any of those words mean, except maybe polygraph. Um, one of the things that trained professionals do in this who work with sex addicts and partners is we do this thing called disclosure, which is really opening up the partner to know everything, everything that they didn't know about in terms of frequency and quantity and money and all that. So we do a disclosure so that the, there can be kind of an equal playing field for the couple so that everything is known, everything's on the table, there aren't any more secrets and they can start to rebuild really from a, a, at least from, from a space of knowing everything. Um, I have worked with partners who, for example, I worked with some particularly religious partners who said, you know, it is not a part of my religion that, that I cannot leave my spouse. It's not something that I can do and not something I believe in. So, and I know if you tell me all these things that I will want to leave this person and I am not, so I would really prefer to not know. And I fully respect and support the person who does not want to know. Um, I think it's an individual question. Um, I do also think that if that part of restoring trust, if you, if you have enough healthy support and you can tolerate it, is understanding what's happened in your relationship. Because nine times out of 10, what I hear from you spouses when disclosure is done is, I knew that. I just knew when they went here and there and that was going on, that's what they were doing. But what we tell you is that's not what we were doing. And so you have to pick between your feelings and what we say. And a lot of times in disclosure, you say things like, oh, that makes sense to me. Now I know what's been going now. So it puts a lot of pieces together for you guys. But I'll tell you, if you don't feel emotionally stable, if you're not sure if the relationship is going to go forward, if you're, you know, uh, eight and a half months pregnant, there are a lot of reasons why a partner or someone might say, I'm not sure I want to go through this. And I absolutely respect that. And by the way, the addict's going to go, whoo. <laughs> so um, we get asked this all the time about disclosure and polygraphs and, you know, and there is no protocol specifically for polygraphs. Most po poly polygraphers don't yeah, I mean, they, they need to be trained to work with this. So if you are working with a therapist that really knows how to do this, you know, fine, but it's a couple of questions. So, um, but, but I do think I, I've had so many partners that have gone, I know it's bad. I know there's a lot, you know, and they, they, they know the stuff where the, you know, where it, it was gaslighting and they go, it was just enough. And, you know, like we, we can find a path beyond this. 
And, and some partners never get that. You know, there's a divorce, there's a death or whatever. They never get the chance and you can still heal. So, so I think that it really is an individual situation as to what, you know, what you need. So, so I'm, but there's so many good questions that I wanted to get to, but I know, Tammy, we'll be we back should next do some, week. We should do some kind of double up or special day or something where, you know, I have to think about that in the new year. You know what? We can now because the 605 meeting is no longer gone. So we could do a no longer an extra going. special. Well, it, it's not right behind us. It's now on Thursday night. Oh, it changed times. So, so okay. it changed times. It's still going, but not right behind us. So we actually could do, you know, the was, extended play, like the old. But I was thinking just to say play. it like a like at a special event, like a Saturday oh. where I did some stuff and some other people on our team did some stuff. And that might be fun. We'll have to talk about that. Hey guys, yes. you rock. We're, we're going to dinner or going to bed or whatever yes. you're doing. Um, have a safe week. Please take care of yourselves and, uh, and each and other. Email me if you have questions or I can be of support. Thanks. Bye, Bye for now.